Today, it's great to chat with John Levy on the podcast. John is a behavioral scientist best known for his work on influence, human connection, and decision-making. John specializes in applying the latest research to transform the ways companies approach marketing, sales, consumer engagement, and culture. His clients range from Fortune 500 brands like Microsoft, Google, Ab and Bev, and Samsung to startups. His latest book is called You're Invited, The Art and Science of Cultivating Influence. John, so great to chat with you today. Scott, this is such a treat. This has been like a year in the making. I'm so excited to be here and we're going to have a ton of fun. So where should we start today? Oh boy, Um, it's a good question. How about we start with a little bit about you? You know, I'm really curious in uh, in your own sort of um, journey here because you know, how does one get in, in such interest in this topic of influence? I believe around age 28 is kind of a, a point in, in in where you were you were starting to get super super interested in this topic and the research yeah. around it, right? So I was, uh, I think I was the stereotype for not living up to their potential. I um, <laughs> it was so ridiculous. I was insanely in debt from college. I was overweight. I wasn't dating very much. I felt like I was kind of, you know, n- not having the life I wanted. I felt like I had a lot of potential, but none of it was being realized. And I came across a study by these two guys, Christakis and Fowler. They were curious about the obesity epidemic. They were curious, does obesity spread from person to person like a cold, or is it a percentage of the population like Alzheimer's? And what they found was absolutely startling. It turns out that if I have a friend who's obese, my chances increase by 45%. My friends who don't know them have a 20% increased chance of obesity, and their friends have a 5% increased chance. So we have an effect three degrees out for anything from happiness, marriage and divorce rates, smoking habits, voting habits. Literally, our life is heavily influenced several degrees out by people we don't even know exist because of the decisions that they make. And so I wanted to figure out, okay, if that's the case, how do I surround myself with the people who are the best at what they do? The ones that can have the biggest impact on the things I care about. Yeah, that was really eye-opening, eye-opening reading your book and learning about just how much uh, the people around us really can help us influence our own goals, but how much networks can help to make the world a better place. So I, I really I really was quite eye-opening about that. So you're around 28, 29, and you decide to start this thing that you call the Influencer's Dinner, right? Mm-hmm. But it, it's an interesting twist. Can you kind of tell tell our listeners a little about the the roles of this dinner? It's kind of a little a little bit different. So I wanted to figure out how to connect with these highly influential people, and I realized I needed to do something completely out of the ordinary, or they would never notice me. So I invite 12 people at a time but they're not allowed to talk about what they do or even give their last name. They cook dinner together. And then when we sit down to eat, we play a ridiculous game. We try to guess what people do professionally. And then we find out we're sitting with Nobel laureates, Olympians, editors in chiefs, celebrities, Grammy award winning musicians. I've hosted over 2000 people ranging from like the world's foremost expert on infectious diseases to uh, members of royalty and even the voice of the dog from who let the dogs out, who won a Grammy for the song, like just ridiculous people, right? And it's grown into by the largest community of its type in the world, over 2000 members, 227 dinners, 10 cities in three countries. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's kind of silly. Um. It sounds pretty awesome. Not silly. It sounds awesome. And, you know, this idea, you know, what it's turned into, it seems like it's a little bit different than what it originally started. So your original goal wasn't necessarily to like change the world. It was oh, to yeah. bring no. together awesome people is what you say in yeah. your book. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I figured that, you know, I didn't want to be a networker. When you look at the, the research on networking, people absolutely hate it. I mean, it's just miserable. It makes us feel dirty. What I realized doesn't make us feel dirty is making friends and being a part of a community. So I figured if I could get these people not just to connect with me, but with each other, their lives would improve. And so would mine in the process. So that always was my focus. It's 
not just about knowing somebody, but for them to know people that I know and as many of them as possible so that everybody's better off. Yeah, so the word this is very interesting because the word influence connotes something different to me than the word connection. Yet your book really is about meaningful connections. And yes. so it's kind of you're kind of reframing the whole idea of influence because I have to be honest, the word influence itself makes me cringe. Um <laughs> before I met before I met you, it made me cringe and you've kind of changed what it means, what it could mean. But usually, you know, before I met John, <laughs> uh, the, the idea of influence to me um, is not is not something that, that really stood with my own values in the sense it felt like a manipulation uh, in yeah. some sense. It felt like a, a sort of um, tied more to the need for power and control than the need and than the need for for meaningful, authentic connection. Can you tell me how you're seeing uh, the relationship between influence and meaningful connection be um, really quite intimate with each other? So it's, it's interesting. I, when I first started looking at this stuff, there was no use of the word of influence in our culture. And Robert Cialdini had written a great book about it, but nobody discussed it uh, back in 2008. It wasn't until Instagram became popular that we started using this term influencer. And it's rather unfortunate because influence is the ability to have an impact or effect on a person or an outcome. Now that's really different from power. Power is using force. It's cajoling, manipulation, threats, right? The type of stuff that was very accurate to human history but less important now when there's open communication. Influence is something we opt in for. It's because I'm your friend and enjoy spending time with you, I'll have an open conversation with you. And in that conversation, you'll put out ideas or suggestions, and that will influence me. That will potentially guide my thinking. It doesn't guarantee anything because you're not using force. So my general premise is that our influence our ability to create an impact, to affect the things we care about is a byproduct of who we're connected to because it's near impossible to impact people we don't know. How much they trust us because Barry, the reason that you have influence on me is because I trust you. Yeah. If I didn't trust you, then I wouldn't listen to a thing you said. And then if we're both part of the same community, if we have experience a sense of belonging, that influence is expanded dramatically. And the reason for that is that if we're part of the same community and you have an idea, then that will not only reach me, but it will reach your friends. And if we share the same friends, it'll reach me again. So it begins to reach these critical masses. So by being part of a community or having a sense of belonging, our influence is expanded, right? There's more reach and sustainability to these ideas. So I'll be honest, I probably should have used a different subtitle for my book. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, but the, the point still remains that we all really care about influence. I would say for the most part in this stage in our culture, we avoid trying to use manipulation or power or force. Uh, and unfortunately, the word influence has gotten a negative connotation in certain circles. Yeah, I mean, it's a good thing to have positive influence on the world. Uh, people, I mean, people really want to make an impact as much as they want to have connections with others. If you can have both needs satisfied um, in a synergistic way, then uh, mm. all the better, all the better for humanity and for yourself, you know, right? I, I think one of the big things right now is that uh, people's ability to influence their own lives has probably reduced a lot in the sense that, you know, in 1985, the average American had three friends besides family. Mm. By 2004, just 19 years later, the average American had just about two friends. Mm. Now, that's pretty crazy, losing 50% of your close social ties as a country. Yeah. And what really worries me about this is that we like to blame social media, but I think the culprit is people moving for work and after school. Because when you relocate, you reset your social ties. 
if you've ever have you ever moved yes uh, this where i am right now was an unexpected move all right so where are you california but right. i moved from new york and so my hunch is i mean you may have already had a bunch of friends in california ahead of time and that's why you moved there but for the most part you probably have a lot of social ties in new york and then when you reset your location you're kind of beginning from scratch a little it felt that and, way for sure and so if that's the kind of experience that you you have and people are staying less and less time at companies and moving more and more often then it suggests that we're going to end up lonelier and more isolated now my concern with that is that if you look at the research on human longevity, it's not like eating lots of kale <laughs> and doing yoga that will predict your life expectancy. After your genetics, number two is strong social ties, right? The thing that we just saw has reduced dramatically for Americans. And number one is social integration, this idea of being part of a community or having a sense of belonging. And so what really worries me is that loneliness is on par with smoking a pack a day of cigarettes in terms of its health impact. We are lonelier than ever, especially due to this pandemic. We're more isolated. And when we talk about influencing our life, whether that's having healthy habits, exercising, pushing our career in the direction that we want, whatever it is, that means that we are having less and less influence over the things that we care about. Absolutely. And I really like this connection you make between influence and building trust quickly. Hey everyone, I'm excited to announce that the eight-week online Transcend course is back. This iteration of the course, which will run from September 5th to October 24th of this year, will use science to help you live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self-actualized life. There will be limited slots available, so save your spot as soon as possible. In addition to the regular class pricing, we're also offering limited slots for personal self-actualization coaching. Save your spot today by going to transcendcourse.com. That's transcendcourse.com. The Transcend Course is just one of the offerings of the brand new Center for the Science of Human Potential. The Center for the Science of Human Potential's mission is to use science to help each person fulfill their highest potential and contribute to the good of society. Toward that goal, we offer classes, coaching, and consulting opportunities to help people apply the latest science to help themselves, their organizations, their schools, their families, and their communities to be more creative, loving, and full of transcendent possibilities. For more on the center, you can go to scienceofhumanpotential.com. Hey everyone, doing this podcast for y'all is one of my greatest privileges, but the cost of maintaining a professional production like this one really adds up. I'm grateful to today's sponsors who help fund the show, but if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. You'll get completely ad-free episodes all while directly supporting the show for as little as $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash psychpodcast. Now, mm. I'm, I assume you mean building trust in, in not manufacturing trust, but uh, building authentic trust, giving a person a, a real reason to trust. Not, not like sales, shark salesman kind of trust. So, yeah. so I'd, I'd argue that uh, the way that we relate to like used car salesmen, right? <laughs> Which are like, yeah. this, uh, every so often people uh, do studies to rank what's most and least trusted. Uh, and I would agree. I think it's like car salesmen are, are near the bottom of the list. Yeah. And uh, so I think the question is why? And when you look at research on trust, uh, there's this kind of funny thing that happens. So if, if I ask you, okay, what's the most important aspect of a relationship? Always, everybody says trust. And then you ask a person, great, what is trust? And they're like, well, it's, uh, I don't know, that you'll risk something. And like, eventually they get to this idea that you're willing to be vulnerable, right? Vulnerability means that you're at risk of something. And I say, great, then what is trust made out of? And no one can ever tell me. But researchers have been able to tease out that it's most agree it's made out of three things. The first is competence, your ability to do something. The second is uh, honesty or integrity. You're truthful. And then the third is 
benevolence. You have my best interests at heart. Mm-hmm. Now, what's really weird is that, yes, those are three critical pillars, but they're not all equally valued. So if I uh, hear that you had an interview and the interview just bombed, do I go, oh, Scott's like, I can't trust him. He's incompetent. No, I say like he probably got his second COVID shot and was tired. And, you know, we all have an off day and next interview is going to be great. So a slip up in competence, not such a big deal. But here's a question for you. If you find out that somebody lied to you, would you say, oh, that was a one-off? Or would you begin to doubt everything that they have said or things that they say moving forward? Yeah, right. I mean, that would it, it, that starts to cast a, a bit of a shadow. Right? Yeah. So like a breach in honesty is a big deal, mm-hmm. much bigger than a breach in competence. Mm-hmm. But here's a really weird loophole. So the two of us are hanging out. We're apparently in California now where you're living. And we're walking down the street and I say, hey, do you mind if we stop by a friend's house? I want to pick something up real quick. You go, yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. So we walk to my friend's house. We walk in and 40 of your closest friends jump out and scream, surprise. And we celebrate your birthday. It would be very, very strange if you turned to me and said, John, you just lied to me. We can't be friends anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a really good point. There's the, there's a sort of a, uh, well, intention certainly matters. <laughs> And so that's because we value benevolence. I misled you for your best interests at heart, right? Hmm. I value that above honesty and honesty above competence. So this kind of now points to the car salesman problem, right? Because I trust a nurse because I believe she's benevolent. She didn't go into the practice of medicine to make a payday, right? You don't deal with people who are that grumpy, upset, and ill, hopefully unless you care about them, right? You're benevolent. You believe that the nurse is honest. There's also a whole lot of checks and balances in there to make sure that they remain truthful, right? And then as far as competence, there's minimum requirements and all that. And so we feel that they fulfill all three characteristics. Whereas the salesman, you do not walk in there and think a used car salesman is benevolent. You do not think, oh, that person has my best interest at heart and they'll give me exactly the car I need. Uh, So this is all to say that what's interesting about people is that we lead with competence most of the time. Like, oh, I can do this job. I'll be great at it rather than leading with benevolence, which is what we really care about. Maybe instead I should be leading with, it seems that you really care about the outcome of this project. If I did my job exactly the way that you were hoping it would go, what would you, what would your experience of it be? Now I've very clearly put myself into the other person's shoes and expressed that I'm concerned with what matters to them most. No, I really, really like that. Um, it's something, an idea occurred to me I wanted to to talk with you. So it seems like a big part of having influence is being able to be in a position to help others have influence. Um, so, you know, so not just uh, bringing together people who already have influence, but giving the voiceless more of a voice. I'm wondering what ways are you helping to give uh, people who don't have influence already, but that you see potential in them? Because I know, John, you're such a caring person and you have such a um, desire to, to help the world be a better place. In what ways do you help the, the, the voiceless kind of have more influence? So I think that that's, first of all, a really complex problem that you can attack from many angles. Uh, you know, the, the, there's this funny thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I'm sure you've come across a lot yeah. of times, oh, yeah. which is, yeah. in general, the less you know about something, the more confident you are about it. And the yeah. more you know, the more you realize the complexities of these things. And so, you know, in my case, there's two ways or three ways that I really support those who are under 
voiced, let's say. Undervoiced, yeah. Uh, so the first is that if you believe this idea that who we're connected to, how much they trust us, and the sense of belonging they experience can define your influence, the first thing I do is kind of vet a few people or causes, and then I connect them with others, right? So I say, okay, you really care about adoption. Let me introduce you to a bunch of celebrities who adopted their kids, and let's see if they can amplify your message, right? And introductions don't cost me anything. They cost me time, which is obviously a commodity that we all have limited supply of, but still five minute email world of difference for people. The second is that I've made it my life's work to bring people together. And so as I bring people together, I provide a platform during those events or experiences for people to share their messages and ideas. And so every other week now, it used to be every week, I host about 150 to 200 people um, at a digital salon. I used to do, do them in person when, but I didn't want anybody to die of COVID. So we went online. And at these, we have several speakers, usually pretty high profile people, but we always leave a spot open and one of the three speaking slots at minimum for a social cause. And this could be anything. Most recently, it was this. Uh, we explore the topic of stop Asian hate, and at other times, it was about the Black Lives Matter movement, and yet at other times, it was about literacy. And what we do is try to curate the people in the room, so that the right people are hearing this message, the ones that can be the biggest support. So, listen, I'm clearly not the wealthiest person in that room. Every time, I'm clearly not the the smartest. <laughs> especially when there's like two or three Nobel laureates, right? But what I am is probably the best at connecting people. And so that's how I use my superpower because I can allow people to connect and I can put them in a situation where they can build trust quickly. And there's a bunch of little hacks to building trust. If you want, I'm happy to discuss those. You're very good at building trust. You're a mega connector for sure. And and something else that strikes me is that the people that you've introduced me to, um, or just people that I've talked to, who it turns out we we both find out that we know you, that we know we both know you. People have have nothing but good things to say about you. So it oh, just wow. makes me, th- yeah, you should know that. <laughs> so you. it 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 makes me think about the important uh, the importance of reputation in this whole equation as mm. well. Like it really pays to not be an asshole in this world as much as assholes oh, don't yeah. realize real, they don't realize it. Like assholes don't tend to realize that, but it, it is important to not be an asshole, right? It's, I think the way I would describe it is that, uh, and I kind of joke around with my best friend about this, that my best friend is this guy, Liam Alexander. And, uh, and we joke about how I'm always after the long con, like I'm going to become <laughs> best friends with him, spend the next 10 years supporting any project he does. So that the moment he's not looking, I will take $3 from his wallet and I could finally have those $3. Uh, but like in the sense that, uh, when it comes to human relationships, they are their own benefit. Meaning most of the people that I connect with have zero business case for my career, right? Like I'm not going to work on a project with a Nobel laureate. I don't know enough about particle physics. You never know. (laughs) I mean, like, sure. You never know, but like realistically, you know, my business is on the marketing and sales and company culture side of stuff. It's in the human connection side. And same thing with Olympians or even Grammy award winners. I'm not going to suddenly go into the music industry at age 40 and start dropping beats or something like that. I don't know. Uh, Relationships are their own reward, not the contract I can hopefully get from any one particular person. And so I really look at our relationship as a long-term investment into a great life that I don't know what the what the benefit of of causing trouble or being dramatic like it, it if I look at our friendship as something that's going to be 70 years long then it it changes the context 
versus if I'm just trying to get a transaction out of somebody. And then yeah. you behave completely different. Uh, and I think that's kind of the context that I try to, to form my relationships from. The other is that Adam Grant did this wonderful research project where he looked at, in his book, Give and Take, he talks about this. People who are givers, those who are generous. People who are takers, those that are, let's call them selfish. And people who are matchers, those that mimic other people's behavior. Mm -hmm. And he asked the question, who are the least and the most successful? And I believe he looked at like medical students and salesmen and a few other groups. And to everybody's surprise, the least successful were the givers, those who are generous. Mm -hmm. And what was really strange was that the most successful were also the givers. And the difference was the givers that knew how to draw the line versus those that didn't. Hmm. So if you give so much as a medical student that you're not spending any time studying the material you need to, you just help everybody else, you're going to do terrible on your tests. So you'll be at the bottom of the class. But if you can be generous and support people, then the givers will also support you. And so will the matchers, those that mimic behavior. And then you can also still focus on the things that you need to for yourself. And that puts you in the best situation. So it turns out that the best strategy in general is to actually be generous. And it gives you the best chances of success at anything you care about. So I think that, uh, that the upside of being generous is way more positive than the downside. Like, sure, occasionally people take advantage, but if you know where to draw the line, you can make sure you have healthy behaviors. I'd like to take a moment to share about one of our sponsors, Skillshare. When was the last time you picked up a new skill or decided to build up an existing one? I signed up for Find Your Style on Skillshare the other day, and I'm already learning so many strategies for exercising my creativity. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can accomplish real growth with so many different classes to explore. Whether you're interested in creative writing and film or entrepreneurship and web development, Skillshare has classes for folks of any experience level. You can work on hands-on projects and experience real improvement. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com psych and get a one month free trial of premium membership. That's one month of premium membership at Skillshare.com slash psych. I'd like to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? For quite a lot of us right now during this coronavirus pandemic, we are struggling with our most fundamental basic needs, such as our needs for security, connection, and opportunities to master our work. I think all of us could use some therapy right now. I know I sure could, which is why I've really been enjoying working with a professional therapist at BetterHelp so I can realize the best version of myself even under the current circumstances. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating with your therapist in just under 48 hours. Note that it's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. In fact, the service is available for clients worldwide. What I really like about BetterHelp is that you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you often have to do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is really committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Here's a recent one. Camilla helped me turn my life around. Everything has been so positive for me since our first session. Deep gratitude. I'm pleased to announce a special offer for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get 10% off your first month of professional counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash psychpodcast. That's better H-E-L-P slash psychpodcast. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Okay, now back to the show. 
Yeah, and generosity uh, doesn't always have to be a strategy. It can uh, just intrinsically be enjoyable just for yeah. nothing else other than uh, the the feeling it, it, it to feel like you're you're a good person. <laughs> yeah, I I was recently in a clubhouse room and I have a pretty high speaking rate, but every so often I'll I'll be asked to give a talk that I kind of want to, but the rate isn't huge. And and so what I'll do is I'll tell the the organization, listen, I'll I'll consider doing this, but I want all of the money to go to charity. And those actually, those talks give me a huge amount of satisfaction because let's be honest, like when we earmark our own money, we would have never earmarked that for charity. But knowing that, okay, it's a win for the company and then it's a win for this charity, that makes me incredibly happy. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it, it depends like how one defines success, right? I mean, if, mm -hmm. if you define success as positively impacting the world and touching the lives of others, inspiring others, then it, there's the, the intrinsic reward is right there, you know? Yeah. Mm. yeah. So I, I would love to give your listeners a fun little behavioral hack, though, to help them Great. connect uh, more deeply with people, uh, if that's okay. Heck yeah, of course. All right, cool. So let's do this. Here's the funniest thing that I, like, as I kept going through all the research and everything, continuously, what drove me crazy was that every strategy, mostly companies take, but also often just people in their social relationships take to build trust with people doesn't actually work. Mm. So two second version, if... I give you a swag bag at a party. What do you do with the swag bag? I probably throw it away immediately. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's essentially saying, hey, could you throw this out for me? Now they spend hours and tons of money for, to try to win you over, to get you to like them more. Or if you get taken to like some crazy business dinner, right? That's super expensive. More often than not, you're going to be stuck talking to people you don't necessarily want to talk to. And so... Winning people over with gifts, there is a scenario it could work, but it, it would be like, if I know that you're a super fan of Harry Potter and I get you like a first edition signed, right? Or something like that. Because that's like a very intimate gift that's specific to you. But in general, what really works is the exact opposite of gift giving. And it's called the Ikea effect. So human beings disproportionately care about their Ikea furniture because they had to assemble it. Meaning... Anything we put effort into, we care about disproportionately. That's why people care about their own kids, right? Like not other people's kids. Or why adopted children are loved just as much as those who are born to the parents. It's because we care about what we invest effort into. Mm. Now, here's what's absolutely insane. When people try to win others over, they try to buy them stuff. Or they won't accept favors. So they'll say, oh, I can help you with this. And they'll say, oh, I wouldn't want to bother you. Or they'll do things like, oh, I don't want to bother that person by asking their opinion or a favor. But it turns out that if we get people to invest effort into us, they'll care about us more. We're actually harming our relationships when we don't allow others to contribute. You are literally saying, yeah, I care about you but not enough for you to invest any effort. And that's really quite literally the opposite of what we should be doing. And when I tried to figure out why this is the case, uh, it turns out that the process by which human beings build trust is actually traditionally seen as through micro actions. So uh, I ask you about how your parents are doing or how, you know, how's your dog or something like that. And when that kind of stuff happens, then it says, oh, John really cares. He's aware of my life. And that's because of something called a vulnerability loop. And it works like this. So let's say, Scott, the two of us are walking down the street, right? It's, it's after your birthday party. <laughs> uh, you're surprised right there. And I say, oh, my God, I'm so overwhelmed. In that moment, I just put out a signal of vulnerability. Now, if you make fun of me or ignore it, trust will be reduced. Mm. But if you say, John, I've 
been so overwhelmed this week too. What's going on with you? You've just signaled vulnerability back at the same level. And now we've demonstrated that we can trust each other at this higher level of vulnerability. Yeah. And that's how trust is created. So this means two things. One is when we apply this Ikea effect at my dinners, we do it by getting people to cook together. Then it opens and closes a bunch of these vulnerability loops. As I say, Hey, can you pass me the, you know, tomatoes or whatever it is. And when you do, it opens and closes a loop. But it also means that when we're interacting with people, we want to be on the lookout for when they put out a signal so that we can close it. It also means that sometimes we need to be the ones to start by putting out our own signals. That way it gives people an opportunity to complete the loop and increase trust between the two of you. I love that. I, I'm trying to think on the spot, something really clever way to respond to you to indicate that I am signaling <laughs> trust, but nothing trust. Imme immediately came to mind other than maybe just that joke itself increased trust. <laughs> I'm being vulnerable. Just... I'm being vulnerable at a meta level by saying that I couldn't come up with anything super clever right in that. Oh, moment. interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's actually perfect. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's uh, what's interesting is that. I think that a lot of people right now are a little concerned about social interaction because they feel like their muscles have atrophied. And, yeah. and, and my recommendation has been, okay, let's just lean into that. Let's tell people, I have not been out of the house in a year. I have no idea how to have a conversation anymore. <laughs> Is there anything you want to talk about? Because I literally don't have a clue. <laughs> yes. I read an article about that. I, I think it was, yesterday or something came out but what if my personality has changed you know and what if i'm neurotic oh, yeah. in introvert now you know and yeah we all kind of feel like neurotic introverts during the pandemic let's all bond over that let's all bond over that yeah i think that's all it takes right if one of the my favorite historical moments from a community perspective was when in world war ii when germany started uh bombing cities in england uh, then, you know, the locals of London fled to the bomb shelters in the subways. And there was this fear that fighting would break out at the shelters. Mm. But what's pretty amazing is that when you put human beings under high levels of pressure in groups, in general, uh, we do really well. Like there was no major breakouts of craziness. People self-organized. And, and act with the group's best interest when stress is really high. Like there's very actual little like looting or things like that that end up happening. When, when Katrina hit, it was mostly people supporting each other and saving each other's lives and putting themselves at, at personal great risk to help one another. And I think that that kind of demonstrates why our species has been able to survive, is that we are fundamentally driven by pro-social behaviors especially when things go wrong. You've really, you've kind of, you've, you've cracked this code in, in such a beautiful <laughs> way. Um, you know, and, and just even uh, your argument in your book that connection is not the same thing as networking. I mean, that's, that's going to be a revolutionary idea to a lot of people in Silicon Valley, you know, it kind of, it's, it's, I think it's interesting thing. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I think that's really interesting. It, I, it may depend on, uh, you know, how good they are at picking up on social cues. That's uh, true. That's true. Right. So like, listen, it, but, but regardless of anything, if we're really honest, what we connect over and, and I could be wrong about this, right. But if you really look, we connect over activities, interests and culture, right? So like in a uh, culture could be uh, the high Jewish holidays, right. Or Chinese New Year or something like that, right? So there's a culture that you're a part of that engages in certain activities, and that's what has you connect. An interest would be like, oh, I really, I'm really into martial arts. So I go to a martial arts school, I become friends with the people there. And an interest would be like, uh, sorry, an activity would be, you know, I have a friend, Daniel Lakin, who runs something called uh, Urban Sherpas, which is a group of people who just oh, walk. Yeah. And, 
and what what like he'll just design a walk like we're walking across three bridges today and it's a group of people and it's not like a hobby or anything walking isn't exactly a hobby but uh it's an activity he plans an activity and people actually end up bonding and connecting over it and that's because for human beings putting us in front of each other for an interview is terrible it's not natural for our species we survived because we worked together so give us something to do together and we'll like each other more. Let's go on a hike. Let's go paint a painting or draw a mural or something. But don't just sit me down in front of somebody with some alcohol. Like it's, it's awkward. <laughs> it, for sure. But look, you probably learned a lot through trial and error. I mean, can you tell me about some of the yeah. early oh, days yeah. of these meetings? There must have been awkward moments, right? I mean, you, and, and you learned and grew. Oh my grew God, yes. <laughs> oh wow so in the early days tell me all, some no stories was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, at the first dinner i hosted it was probably like in summer and the air conditioner broke so imagine you have 12 people in a confined space no air conditioning and an oven on uh everybody was like sweating through their clothing they were like you know trying to chop salad but there was no physical space to move like it was just a train wreck and mm. In retrospect, you know that this concept of type two fun, like things that are fun in retrospect, but not really at the moment. So the uh, in retrospect, because it was such a train wreck, it was actually really great. Uh, in the sense that I was very honest with people. I'm like, I'm trying to figure this out and I want your help. And it created vulnerability loops. And the types of people I invited, they weren't the impressive people I invite these days. They're wonderful. They're great friends. They're super interesting people. But I just, you know, I didn't grow up knowing fancy <laughs> award winners. Um, so, but I think it allowed for the vulnerability loops to, to build early and for people to want to support more and then recommend their friends. Because once they went through such a crazy experience, they were more open to their friends having or they were interested in their friends sharing in the experience. That's kind of like the early days. I had no idea what I was doing. I would walk up to complete strangers at parties that I heard were like successful and I'd pitch them on it and I'd get it wrong the way that I pitched. It was awkward. And they'd be like, what are you even talking about? And I'd try again oh. <laughs> and, and I embarrass myself. I'd go home kicking myself being like, oh, how could I mess that up so bad? I, to be honest, I don't remember who those people were anymore. I just remember the feeling of awkwardness. And I just kept trying different ways of explaining to it, it, it until it kind of fell on something really that worked. And then I did something. Um, I, I kept redesigning parts of the dinner. So like at, by this third or fourth dinner, I'd lay out all the equipment that people needed so that they didn't have to search the kitchen for it. I gave stations, I assigned people to work together and bit by bit, it got, you know, really, really like organized and functional. And there's something very fun about feeling the improvement from time to time. And then what ended up happening was uh, the dinner started really succeeding. So I, there were ridiculous moments. One of my favorite was this rather tall woman was making guacamole with a black gentleman about like six, six, one. And uh, they're talking about her division three basketball career. And when they sat down to guess, everybody ended up finding out that she was a journalist, a reporter on a television, I think on like MSN, uh, BC or something like that. And everybody was guessing what he did. And he, they thought was a businessman or a musician or something. And eventually he said, my name is Isaiah Thomas. I'm a 12-time NBA all-star. Sure. And, uh, and then he talked about all the championships and all that. And, uh, and she literally took her napkin, put it on her face, and was like, Isaiah Thomas. I was bragging about my Division three basketball career to one of the <laughs> greatest basketball players of all time. And like she sank in her chair, and I think she refused to talk the rest of the time. But like those kind of moments are so absurd. Like you can't design that. You can't plan that. It's just kind of silly. And so we've had a few moments like that throughout the years. Uh, one was a, a guy 
turned to the person sitting next to him and said, as, uh, after all the guessing, and before he said who he was, uh, the guy said, there's no way you'll remember this, but 15 years ago, I emailed you what, asking what I should do with my career, and you told me to go into research. And now I'm one of the top, you know, no. like I'm a super respected neuroscientist. Uh, and, you know, this guy's published in Nature. He's my, my research partner. Uh, his name is Moran Cerf. And the person he said it to was Nobel laureate Dan Kahneman. Oh, <laughs> like the father of behavioral economics. He was just economics. on this podcast. He was, just, he was, was the he? prior guest on the podcast. He was the prior guest on the podcast, Dan. Yeah. Danny Kahneman. <laughs> that guy's the goat, yeah. right? Greatest of yeah. all time, hands down. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the. You well, know. you're in good company, buddy. You're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's a legend. Well, John, look, you're you're awesome yourself. Now, um, at what point do you like? Do you do you feel like? Did you ever feel imposter syndrome like at, at like in the early days or something? Because I mean, you're you're awesome. <laughs> You shouldn't Scott, have to question, all, but I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. You're adorable if you think I still don't. I, when there's literally like a Olympic gold medalist to your left and a Nobel laureate to your right, the only yeah. person that could make you feel important is your 80 year old Jewish mother. Like the, the, uh, <laughs> here's the, the, the issue that when you're really embedded in scientific knowledge and research, I think a bit of imposter syndrome is really healthy because our objective isn't to be right. Our objective is to find out how quickly we can that we're wrong uh, because that'll actually get us to where we need to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm not feeling a bit, I, I don't think imposter syndrome is the right word, but if I'm not doubting things, at least on a somewhat consistent basis, I don't think I'm doing my job well. And so uh, my objective isn't to be as impressive or as successful or as rich as the people who attend. My objective is how quickly can I bond them and how strongly can I build a community? And for that, imposter syndrome is unassociated. Because if there's anybody out there who's better than me at it, I just want to learn from them and have them <laughs> suck up every ounce of knowledge. Because the objective is independent of me. It's something probably most people never associate to me. It's how close you feel to the next person is my metric of success. And that will likely never be directly tied to me. That'll be tied to that person. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I was going to respond to you if you ever feel imposter syndrome. Bec uh, I would say, I don't. I personally, my my personal philosophy is I don't view the worth of a person the extent to which they've had public achievements. You know, mm. um, I really do uh, consider character and and the, the one's being versus doing more important to me. Um, I really appreciate your being, John, and I just want to leave today with this quote of yours. You say, the difference between us needing to pop a Xanax, overeating, or hiding our problems, and us finding a solution is our relationships. Um, thanks for the uh, the great work you've done in this world to increase meaningful relationships and to create these networks um, that then have a life of their own and and go out there and make the world a better place. So thanks so much for doing that and for being on the podcast today. Oh, this has been an absolute pleasure. And thanks for making this so fun. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show. And tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.